The Lakota's primary weapon, the bow and arrow, was more than 2,000 years old, hardly the latest technology. Early arrows were tipped with brittle stones, such as flint or obsidian. A stone was chipped or napped to a sharp point, then lashed to the end of an arrow shaft with animal tendon. It's believed the bow and arrow was first brought to the Great Plains sometime between 500 and 600 BC. Later, European traders supplied tribes with prefabricated metal tips that had often been hand forged by blacksmiths in Europe. These thinner, flatter steel tips fit much more easily and securely into wooden arrow shafts and had greater durability than stone. As white settlers ventured onto the plains, warriors found another source for metallic arrowheads. We would take barrel hoops or wagon wheels and take the iron from that and manufacture arrow points out of iron. At the opposite end of the arrow, fletching made of bird feathers helped stabilize the missile in flight. There's fletching of hawk feathers, wild turkey wings, which was much more suitable under uh, many conditions. They're a lot more durable. Eagle feathers were seldom used at all, just because of the fragility of the feather. A Plains Indian carved bows from hard woods like ash, hickory, and Osage orange. The bow string was made from five or six strands of buffalo tendon, or sinew, braided to form a tough cord. What sinew was, was basically the, the muscle fiber, the tendon, that ran along either the backbone of the elk or buffalo or its leg. And it's a very wide tendon, and it could be basically ripped apart into very fine fibers or string, so to speak. And it's very, very strong. You cannot break it with your hand. This is Aaron Tenbears of the Lakota Nation. He's going to tell us about that most familiar piece of Native American technology, the bow and arrow. Aaron, these bows that you have here, are these typical from the 1860s? Yeah, they sure are. They're uh, seldom longer than three feet in length, so this way they'd easily be adaptable and able to be fired on horseback. And what was the typical range of this weapon? Well, there are different variations of the short bow. These are what we call a self bow. They're not uh, sinew backed, uh, and this would be the back of the bow. Sometimes they place sinew or rawhide or even snakeskin to help compound the bow and make it a little bit more powerful. So the average range on a self bow, you'd be looking at about 60, 70 yards. And this is a typical arrow from the period from around the 1860s. You were telling me that there were markings that were put on the arrows. What was the purpose of that? Well, the markings were more like an identifier, let you know uh, which warrior shot what arrow. A lot of times in buffalo hunt, you'd be able to tell which arrow brought down a buffalo. This way, your family could actually receive a portion of that meat. There's also uh, lightning grooves, which go up and down the, the entire length of the arrow shaft. This served two purposes. For starters, the lightning was a symbol of power, and the traditional belief is that it helped the arrow fly farther and straighter. Um, secondarily, it was also a groove mark that prevented the arrow from warping in the sun. Another good point is that the, the bow and arrow is a silent weapon, so that would make it an excellent choice for an ambush, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, without question. This way, uh, you can't be uh, identified as to where exactly it's coming from, or it could be up on a bluff or behind a tree, and there's really no telling. The Native American silencer. <laughs>